here we are. It's huge. <laughs> Podcast 150. And we're Hard doing to believe. we're doing a first. Hard to believe. So was I in the first? Have I was I in You were not one? in episode one. I was not. You want to know who's in episode one? Who's in episode I one? I think it was Will Reinhardt was episode one. Man, I didn't think I could be more angry at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was episode one, but yeah. Okay. And we're doing a first for for 150. We have the first time you're on with another guest in the studio. I know. So Jordan's joining us for the first time. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. So I'll just do the introduction. We won't subject Jordan to our usual pre-interview sports talk. Good. Because that's, that's also there's nothing really going on. We're in the lull part of baseball season and... Anyways, I'll do the introduction. Pretty good fight at the uh, the Uruguay Colombia soccer game last night. Yeah, I heard something about that. So I'm not know. a big soccer fan, so I don't. It wasn't a soccer match. It was it was a good fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fans got fans, into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was, was nice. wild. That was wild. Anyways, I'll do the introduction. On this episode of the AF Exchange, Congress's to do list, the presidential candidate's social security promises, and the Fed's rate cut considerations. Joining us to discuss all of this is AAF President Douglas holtz and making her debut, AAF's Director of Fiscal Policy, Jordan Herring. Thanks you both for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so, for having me. So before we uh, jump into things, as usual, Doug, why don't you tell us what's on your mind? Tariffs. Yeah. Tariffs on the brain. Um, you know, Yesterday, the president announced uh, new steel tariffs and aluminum tariffs, uh, again, using the national security provisions, Section 232. Uh, I didn't like these the first time around when Mr. Trump did them. I don't think there's anything to like about them the second time around. And, uh, you know, in addition to sort of generic objections to, to interference with trade patterns, uh, these were supposed to generate uh, increased capacity utilization in the United States. The supposed national security concern is our uh, mills will close. There'll be no capacity uh, on the, in the military production complex. Th the first round of tariffs did nothing. And so th they haven't worked. I was in the White House in 2001 when we did steel tariffs. They didn't work. Mm -hmm. So we're, we've only got 20 years of failure here, but yet, <laughs> here we go again. Um, these are to keep disguised China steel from coming in through Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, and so now it's there's a 25% tax uh, tariff on steel coming from Mexico and 10% on aluminum, unless you can show that that steel was uh, melted and poured in Mexico. Right. And, and the generic problem for, for people to look at this uh, all the time is that you're going to get steel that can be routed through any country. And so you can disguise steel and have trade diversion. And you can put the the steel into intermediate or finished products and get it into the United States. So it's it's a, a loser's game to try mm -hmm. to track this down. But that is what we're up to. Yeah, broad, broadly speaking, though, like all these tariffs that are coming through on steel. and I mean, steel is an important part of a lot of different industries here in the United States. I mean, we have bridges that we have to repair. We have, you know cars to make, things like that. And so it seems very counterintuitive as we try and get the economy back going <laughs> the way it's supposed to, to be slapping all these tariffs down. Yeah, but I mean, it, uh, when you look closely at this, you usually lose more in manufacturing employment and manufacturing output from the higher cost of the steel than you gain in steel employment and steel production. And, that, and, and it also turns out that not all steel is created equal. There are many different varieties of steel and we're we're really just focusing on a, a single very crude steel that's been coming from china high-end steels that are the things that we now have in a lot of our autos and other products right that are, china's not the source of those mm -hmm. all right well let's speaking of the economy let's jump right into inflation yeah which is top of everybody's mind the past couple of days and months and breaking news for, for breaking all. news <laughs> that you know we got the the june cpi this morning yeah uh top line uh cpi inflation was down a tenth of a percent in june uh, the core was up only 0.1. Expectations were at 0.2. Markets are now pricing at 85% the probability of a rate cut in September. And my advice would be deep breath. Yeah. So, yeah, what, what, what what's the Fed going to do for the rest of the year? Well, I mean, look at the, the whole economy. And, um, you know, the sort of GDP now estimate coming out of the Atlanta Fed is 1.5% GDP growth. That's the same as the first quarter. So there's no deceleration there. New claims for UI which are a contemporaneous indicator. That's what's going on in July, uh, dropped 17,000. So it's not like the labor market is falling apart and they're gonna have to cut to rescue. Um, this is year over year core inflation at 3.4%, not year over year core inflation at 2%. And the, the really good news hidden in here was very weak shelter inflation for the first time. Been waiting for that, a 2.9% annual rate. 
But on the whole, I don't think this changes the fact that we're not at two, the, the open art community is not united, and you have to be at two and confident of two and united to get a rate cut in September. So mm-hmm. count me skeptical. Yeah, I think I think like the forecast still being you know high for the next couple of months really just takes September off the table. And then also the politics behind, behind that a as well. A rate cut in September there. is an invitation for Mr. Trump to launch on the Fed. Yeah. And so the, you have to have a lot of ammunition to do it. And if the labor market was genuinely crumbling, like, yeah. you know, UI claims jump 50,000 and you get an unemployment rate that, that pops up from 4.1 to like 4.5 in a month, yeah, then then you, there's no question you do it and everyone understands it. If you're making a judgment call on, a, on a th- extrapolating thin changes, mm-hmm. that's a much tougher thing to do. Yeah, looking ahead though, what what, what do you, like there's, I, I think you did the CNBC um, for Jobs Day. Um, what, what, there was a conversation about if they have to go ahead, if the Fed in the future, depending on the next president's policy making, would have to raise rates again, and if that's part of their thinking at all, or is that just? They're thinking, Yeah, but you know, th- you can do the the same you know sort of probability evaluation. Uh, what's the probability of unified government, House, Senate, White House? What's the probability of divided government? Yeah. Given those those outcomes, what's the probability of different policies going through, whether they be tariffs or tax cuts or mm-hmm. you know whatever? Sure, they're thinking about that, and they're and they're going to hedge against anything that they can really have a, a high probability will happen. But, but there's not a lot that's clear right now. Yeah. What about the rest of the world? If they will, the Fed mo- make any moves based off of what the European ba- Central Bank does, or um, any of the Asian banks? Not per se. I mean, it's not like ECB goes up, we should go up too. Mm-hmm. It's okay. The ECB went up. What's that say about growth in Europe? What's it, what does inflation in Europe look like? How's that going to affect capital flows and exchange rates in the United States? They'll care about the fundamentals. What's demand for U.S. goods and services? What's the the inflationary pressures that come either from imports, imported goods or domestic goods? That's what they care about. And the ECB is going to influence and react to those things, but it's those things the Fed's going to watch. Interesting. Well, on that note, let's turn to everybody's favorite topic, our favorite topic on this podcast, uh, Social Security um, and spending. Um uh, the both political candidates have avoided this topic like the plague, it almost seems like. But it did come up during the debate a little bit. Um, and, you know, the imp- so we have this impending solvency of Social Security. Uh, so, yeah, Jordan, welcome to the podcast. Thank on that you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank time, you. Time for you, to t- time for you to solve this issue for yes. us. Uh, yeah, so like I said, both candidates have been, have you know, said that they're not going to touch Social Security. But you've written that that's kind of... A bad idea. Yes. So you have both candidates, both presidential candidates and lawmakers on Capitol Hill saying we're not going to touch Social Security. And this promise is framed as protecting benefits, but it's actually an implicit endorsement of a large benefit cut. So to give a little bit of context, the Social Security trustees project that the Social Security Retirement Fund, which currently pays monthly benefits to about 60 million retirees and their survivors, is going to be insolvent in 2033. That's just nine years from now. And under the law, the trust fund does not have borrowing authority, so it cannot borrow from the Treasury to close the gap between revenue and spending. So what that means is that all beneficiaries, regardless of age, income, or need, are going to see their benefits slashed by 21% across the board when the fund runs out. So I did the math on this and kind of quantified what does that look like for beneficiaries of different income levels and different types of couples. So as an example, for a typical middle-income couple retiring in 2033 at the normal retirement age of 67, they're going to see their annual benefits slashed by $15,900. So while they originally would have expected to receive $75,700 in annual benefits, they're actually going to receive $59,800. And I ran the scenarios again, like I said, for different types of retirees at different income levels, and it varies. Um, but again, as I said earlier, you know, by pledging not to touch Social Security, what you know, leaders on Capitol Hill and the presidential candidates are actually signing off on big benefit cuts in just nine years. Mm-hmm. So that, that wonderful applause they did during the State of the Union a couple of years ago when Biden goaded them into saying, we're not going to touch these programs, was really them cheering a benefit cut. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hypothetically, what would be the cut for, a, say, a 75-year-old man who's <laughs> married? In- <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. I'll do the math, and I'll get back to you on that. We, we, yeah, we need some micro data on this yes. one for a certain uh, Yes. <laughs> um, 
um, but yeah, no, so this did come up in the de debate a little bit, um, and, you know, Trump punted, of course, but uh, you, they did ask about, you know, what the candidates' plans were before it was too late. Um, you know, Biden said, but Biden did say that we, uh, that we just need to tax the rich more and the problem will be fixed. You know, what is your reaction to that? Um, I, I, I got asked this by Steve Leesman on the air, and I, the first thing I would say is, it's a terrible precedent to set that we're going to solve our fiscal problem by raising taxes because mm -hmm. you can't. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, um, because Social Security grows more rapidly than revenues do, you can raise the level of taxes and you'll catch up for a while, but then Social Security continue to grow and the revenues won't grow as fast and the gap will widen. So the real issue is how much time are you buying when you do this? And so I did some quick arithmetic. And it turns out you're buying about a year and a quarter, one year, three months, if you raise uh, taxes enough to close the current gap. Mm -hmm. The lesson here is that you have to, to get the growth rate of spending in Social Security and especially Medicare down closer to the growth rate of the economy or you will have this problem forever. That's yeah. the challenge. I mean, so we, we, we go from, what, nine years to 10 years with, with that solution is basically yeah. what you're saying. So, I mean, but like, the, we've had how many blue ribbon commissions on how to f fix this? So we all know what the fix is. It's just getting the politics in line with this? Yes. That's Jordan's job. <laughs> yeah. How's it going, Jordan? <laughs> Touch and go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk more about the Social Security problem. Hopefully, the candidates will talk more about it. I mean, that would be nice if we had an actual conversation around this um, issue. But, yeah, uh, let's do my favorite part of the podcast. Um the trivia section. Okay. Doug hates this section because it's the one time I get to be the smart one in the room. Okay. <laughs> so I'll give you both an opportunity to read it. And it's right up both of your alleys. <laughs> do you have two questions or are we both answering the same question? You're both answering the same question. So So where's the buzzers? I mean, how do we know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just shouted out. Okay. Uh, according to the latest projections by the Congressional Budget Office, the federal government will spend $72 trillion in non-interest spending over the next 10 years. Of that, uh, of that $21 trillion will be annual uh, will be annual appropriations decisions by Congress. How much will be? Re how much of that is? I gave you the answer. You just have to do quick arithmetic. I'm about fifty-one that up. trillion in mandatory yeah. spending, thirty-six of which is Social Security and Medicare. I read too. I read too much into my <laughs> thing, and I gave you the answer. <laughs> So, I yeah. like that one. That was a good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was easy. That yeah. was easy. I messed that up. Yeah. <laughs> That was my favorite part of the podcast, and I messed that up. But anyways, it, what I was trying to do with that one was illustrate how much, you know, like when they argue over the appropriations process, which we're going to get into a little bit in the next segment, um, you know, what they're not, we're not arguing over the real problem in debt. Right. Yeah. The money's in Social Security and Medicare. Yeah. yeah. And and then so I try to explain to people, you know, I'm, I'm not boring you know, former CBO director, green eye shades type. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no soul. Yeah. I acknowledge all of that. But the arithmetic is, if 36 trillion of it's in these two programs, that's where the money is, and if they're growing faster than everything else, that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. And you can dodge and weave and pretend otherwise, and we do that a lot, but, but ultimately it comes down to fixing those programs. And the important thing I think everyone should remember is, fixing them is fixing them on behalf of the beneficiaries, because as Jordan pointed out, the current plan is to cut their benefits by 21%. It's a lot of money, no, bad plan. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, speaking of the annual appropriations process, you know, uh, I know you've been paying pretty close attention to all of this. Give us a rundown where Congress is and what's what's going on there. Sure. So we're about two and a half months uh, from the end of the fiscal year, and Congress has not completed work on any of the 12 appropriations bills. Um, the House and Senate are on very different pages about what they would like to see. So the House has completed markups of all 12 bills, and it's passed four of them through the chamber. Um, they've been appropriating at the cap level set in the Fiscal Responsibility Act of just over $1.6 trillion, and that includes $895 billion for defense and $711 billion for non-defense. And they're not including any of the side deals that were made outside of the FRA. The Senate, finally, as we speak, is actually holding its, the Senate Appropriations Committee is actually holding its first markup on appropriations um, to consider what the levels are going to be for the 12 bills. And they're very likely to appropriate above. So already you have um, the chair of the Appropriations Committee, uh, 
Senator Murray, as well as the Vice Chair Senator Collins, they have agreed on $34.5 billion of emergency funding on top of whatever the top line number is going to be. And they're very likely probably to include some of the side deals made out of the FRA. So what does all that mean? That sets the stage for not completing work on appropriations by the end of the fiscal year on September 30th. So it's very likely the government will operate under a CR, probably at current funding levels. The question is, how long is that CR going to last? Is it going to last you know, for a month? Is it going to last mm-hmm. past the election into next year? My guess would be it's going to at least la- it's going to at least last through the election, and maybe in the lame duck they'll do something about it. Um, but it, again, that sets the stage for a whole another problem in addition to all the other problems yeah. that we have faced going into 2025. So yeah, I mean we've seen this movie before, right? Like the, the, we're going to punt to the election. They'll, yeah. They'll they won't do any after the election. They'll punt to Christmas. They'll punt to next year and keep going. Is that your sense about what, yes, where, where I, they're basically at? Yes, and I will say there's a couple other things that do um, expire as well at the end of this fiscal year. So you have the authorization for flood insurance. You have the offer, authorization for TANF, um, and you have the authorization for SNAP and a couple other agricultural programs as well. The House and Senate each have their own versions of the Farm Bill. There hasn't been really any movement on that. So those are some other things to contend with as we move towards the end of the fiscal year. And yeah. There might be some temporary uh, authorizations for those things included in the CR. Yeah. So, so we'll I mean, see. we know the flood insurance is a big hot yes, button especially issue. with what's going on. my favorite yeah. program. Yeah. And once again, I'm going to call on Taylor Swift to break off the Eras Tour, get <laughs> yeah. back here and advocate for fixing it yeah come on <laughs> this is an ongoing thing i don't know if you've heard the, the taylor swift uh it's her um, fault. <laughs> she he, he doug has long advocated for <laughs> some intervention by taylor swift yeah. in the uh, flood program yeah. um yeah so uh, what are the with the current appropriations? You know, you, with the Senate and House are on the same page. Mm-hmm. Are there sticking? Po- are there what? What are the big like issues? Is it like what you expect or? Yes, and I think you know there were all these side deals made outside of the FRA. So it's a bunch of rescissions of unused COVID relief fund, IRS funding. You know, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee has made it clear that you know he's not incorporating that in any of the bills that they've been considering. I think it's very likely that the Senate. Well, so, you know, I think the Senate wants to appropriate at a higher level. And then there's the whole issue of emergency funding. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Senator Murray and Senator Collins have come out with this agreement to include $34.5 billion of additional emergency funding. So I think it's just a difference of where the levels are going to be. I think it's a beauty of the appropriations process that we can pro- appropriate in advance money for an emergency. It's yeah. not really an emergency then, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unexpe- <laughs> you have to expect the unexpected, Doug. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on that note, I mean, so I mean, this is going to be a little hard to talk about because we don't know what the next Congress is going to look like. But 2025 is around the corner, um, six months, you know, less than six months away at this point. Um, what what are we going to be faced with come January? Most important thing is that January 1, 2025, the debt ceiling comes back in full force. And so I would add to the list that, that Jordan uh, went through push the, the debt ceiling back by you know three to six months, get time to get an administration staffed up, get the new Congress seated, people understand their roles, because raising or suspending the debt ceiling has proven to be just a really problematic exercise for years now, and I don't think we need to be doing that while trying to do the rest of this. Yeah. And so, um, but in the absence of some sort of change, right away the Treasury's in the business of extraordinary measures to keep us under the, the debt ceiling and, There'll be, you know, the the usual game of trying to figure out the X date, the date at which their ability to continue to manage will go away. That that deadline will have some brinksmanship in the politics. Usually, mm-hmm. you know, n- none of that is, is is something that we need to do because there are a lot of other things on yeah. Congress's plate. Like you, like you, like I just said, we've seen that movie before. Correct. We're just you know, <laughs> like Hollywood, just spitting out the same movie over and over again. And like you said, yeah, I mean, it seems we we don't know what this election is going to produce. We could have a new administration having to get new people in. You know, s- congressional leadership is going to change. I mean, we already know that the Senate will have a new Republican leader, and you know, who knows what the House is going to look like in a couple of months. But yeah, who wants to deal with the debt ceiling while that's all going on? And you'd like to get it dealt with better than we have in the past. So the Fiscal Responsibility Act was born of the debt ceiling crisis last time around. And as Jordan just outlined, it doesn't have everything in it that got us to yes. So now there are these side deals that got us to yes and raised the debt ceiling. But 
now they don't want to agree on the side deals. And so if, if you're going to raise the debt ceiling, get a firm deal that's written down and, and raise it. So do you think that, you know, maybe this could be part of the just extent giving yourself some more time could be part of. So not probably this CR to get us past the election, but maybe like the Christmas CR or something like that to, to get us to next year. Yeah, possibly. But then, you know, on January 1, you have the issue of the sequester under the FRA that kicks in as well, mm -hmm. which kind of reduces the cap levels. Um, it's kind of tricky to ex explain a little bit. So it it reduces the cap levels a little bit, but OMB isn't really forced to issue a sequestration order until April 30th. So if appropriations are completed within that time, then the cap levels go back up to the original FRA cap level and really nothing happens. So mm -hmm. April 30th, I would consider the real X date when any kind of sequester would kick in. Interesting. And then is, so when the debt ceiling comes back, is it like that's the X, you know, we always talk about what the X, actual X date is, or does, do they still, the administration have time so to? So the debt ceiling on January 1st, it's going to be reinstated to whatever gross debt outstanding is on that day. And mm -hmm. then at that moment, the treasury will start employing extraordinary measures and, you know, we'll play the guessing game of what the X date is going to be when those measures run out. It's always fun when we had, you know, Gordon on and I would always, you know, try to pinpoint the X date with him and he'd be like, well, if this happens and then be like, huh. <laughs> so um, uh, it's, it's, it's very important to badmouth Gordon, but, but in his defense, <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of it depends on cash flows into the treasury, in particular, you know, the, the income taxes on April 15th. You can buy yourself a lot of time if you get a big, a big influx. If it doesn't come in as expected, suddenly you got a problem. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, thank you both for joining us. That was a good conversation about Social Security and the, what Congress might actually do for the rest of the year and uh jordan thanks for joining us yeah, that thank was, you for having hope, me hopefully you had a good time with us and uh you'll come back again yes definitely doug as thank always you. thanks for joining us my pleasure <laughs> <laughs>